good to see people back out today. Looks like a much better crowd than we had last week, number-wise. Not saying anything about how you look. <laughs> Let's come before the Lord in a word of prayer, please. Dear Heavenly Father, as we gather here on this bright and beautiful morning, we're thankful that we're able to be out, to come to worship, to sing praises to your name. Be with us as we gather here. Be with those who are not able to be out, to be here, to be anywhere. Uh, help them with their problems and inabilities. And be with those who gather in your name in other places. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Okay, let's get ready to stand and sing where we'll never grow old. look at what announcements we have today. Remember the uh, offering box in the four years you come and go today. And of course Sunday school will be right after service if you can join us. Also the financial reports for our spending for last year are on the table in the foyer. You can pick up a copy of that to see how our money came in, what we've done with it for the last year. Are there other announcements now? Oh, happy birthday to Ansley. Okay, Ansley, you're going to have to stand up. Okay. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Ansley. 
Happy birthday to you. Okay. Okay. Any other announcements then? Okay, let's look at our um, prayer concerns that we have in our bulletin. Uh, to the list already in the bulletin, we're adding Jenny Hodges. She's having some problems. And, of course, we've got Betty Taylor listed to send the card to. And um, she has broken her ankle and is in the nursing home for some recovery there. Uh, other prayer concerns or other praises to be lifted up today? The family of Smiley Thurman. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Becky Young. Becky Young. She's got, got two months to live. Yeah, I have Unspoken. <laughs> Others. <laughs> yes, the California flooding. It's and the tornadoes in Alabama. It said California is supposed to have another storm coming through this afternoon through tomorrow. Williams family. Albert Lane Turner. Al cancer. Okay, Albert Lane Turner is facing cancer. <clears throat> okay. Continue to remember Curtis Maxey. He's going for a PET scan and will be starting some chemo treatment soon. Okay, and it is a praise to have Adam and Frosty back with us today. Uh, Adam will not be here next Sunday, right? Cecil will be here next Sunday. I had that wrong one time before, making sure I got it right. And then Adam will be back the following Sunday. Okay, if there's nothing else, then we will turn the service over to Adam. Good morning, my friends. Thank you for being here today. I hope you had a terrific week. It's great to be gathered in the Lord's house to praise, to give thanks, to rejoice, and to worship God and the Savior He sent to redeem us and rejoice in the life that we have in Him. We are here enjoying a beautiful, albeit kind of cold day. Everyone looks happy from up here anyway. But the truth is, I can't tell what's on your mind and what's in your hearts this morning. No one can. If you ever stop and reflect on the stresses in your own life, it makes it makes sense to remember everyone else has worries of their own. Everyone we meet is carrying a burden about which we know nothing. I try to remember that when I meet someone who is grouchy, even to the point of being rude, tell myself it probably has nothing to do with me. Sometimes I even remember to be kind to them, despite their rudeness. Sadly, though, I oftentimes respond with my own grouchiness on my own part. Two weeks ago, my EMT partners and I were dispatched to the scene of an overdose in a fast food restaurant parking lot. When we got on scene, we found the patient sitting in her car and learned that she had been attempting to take her own life. She was okay, physically. She hadn't taken enough to do any real harm to her body and was probably more accurately described as a suicide gesture than an attempt. In other words, a cry for help. She was in her late 20s. She was homeless. She had spent each of the last three nights in a different motel. She was the mother of three small children who were, at that time, staying with at the home of the father of at least one of them, a man who she said didn't want anything at all to do with her. I always chat with the patients on the way to the hospital. It gives me a chance to assess their breathing, their level of alertness, and just their general state of mind. Plus, it puts me at ease, and I like to get to know people. This young woman was at the end of her rope, and her burdens, most of them brought on by her own bad choices, 
were more than she felt she could bear. She found herself in a position in which she thought ending her own life was the best option and even thought it would be better for her children if she did. I faced similar situations with different people many times in my Air Force career. There were two completed suicides, one in each of the two squadrons I commanded. There were others in different organizations at the same basis. There was a suicide when I was deputy commander of a group with five squadrons under it and one suicide in a squadron assigned to the group that I commanded. These things have stayed with me over the years. When we look at the lives our ancestors lived, we think about the difficulties they faced in terms of things like attacks by wild animals, diseases that we no longer have to face like smallpox and polio, crops being wiped out, leaving them in danger of going hungry, just the hazards of living on a frontier. My observations have led me to believe in many ways, ways that matter. They had it better then than we had now. Don't get me wrong, I love being in a nice warm house and I do enjoy some air conditioning in the summertime. I'm going to happily spend the rest of my day watching the NFL playoffs when we get home on television and as much as I enjoy riding horses, I'm very glad that I could make the 36 mile drive here in a warm air conditioned truck instead of being out in the weather riding on horseback, taking a couple of hours to get here. I think Frosty likes that part too. But the human race, at least in the developed world, and let's just come right out and say it, especially here in the United States, seems less resilient now, less capable of dealing with hard times. Modern life brings challenges and stressors we didn't foresee just a few decades ago. At the same time, Modern media seeks to keep the population in an uproar at all times, fanning little embers of flames into roaring infernos of outrage and offending multitudes of people over the smallest things. Social media allows small-minded, mean-spirited people to inflate their own self-image by spewing hatred and bullying vulnerable people from a position of total anonymity without ever having to face the consequences of their own actions, leaving the bullied one emotionally shattered, sometimes so shattered they take their own lives. People, young people in particular, seek happiness in how many likes they get on their social media posts. They live for that little serotonin boost from people liking and commenting on silly things they put on Facebook instead of seeking something meaningful. People measure their value based on whether or not they have the latest smartphone or the top selling brand of shoes, rather than respect earned through deeds and accomplishments. Society follows celebrities who have done nothing worthwhile instead of admiring examples of great achievement, kindness, courage, and service to others. We have it easy. Almost everything we want is at our fingertips right away. You could say society has gotten soft. People quit on their education because the studies are hard. Many quit their jobs because they aren't promoted to a senior leadership position fast enough to satisfy their expectation. Married couples give up on their marriages at the earliest sign of tough times instead of working together to get through it. Hard times create tough people. Easy times, I'm afraid, create weak people. Life has gotten easier to live, but harder to love. Some people look for a quick fix, a crutch to lean on. Drugs have been a problem for years, alcohol for much, much longer. Too many of us look to a new circle of bad friends to dive into harmful ha habits with uncaring people. I doubt you can think of a single instance when that did anything other than make things worse. Things start to pile up. Something happens to make money get tight. Maybe a layoff at work 
or an unexpected ex expense has someone wondering how they're going to pay the bills. That puts a strain on the marriage. The kids act up. Somebody in the family gets sick. Things keep getting worse and people contemplate terrible things to escape rather than finding help. Sometimes even when we look for help from other people, it isn't enough. Veterans in this country have a tremendous support network. I know if I'm down, there are people with whom I served I can call who will immediately and completely understand what I'm dealing with, drop everything they're doing to help me get through it. Maybe there are other veterans here who have been through this themselves. We have a saying in that community, in your darkest hour, when your demons come, call on me, my brother, and we'll fight them together. Most of us, including me, have spent hours on the phone with another veteran who is at the end of their rope. But even, even with this outstanding support network in place, an average of 22 American veterans take their own lives every day. Some people doubt the validity of that statistic and call it misleading, but the truth remains, too many vets of all ages, from all eras still alive today, choose suicide every day. Even with a strong marriage, good friends, and a stable financial situation, sound health, all those other things, so many people still struggle. Why? What is missing? Since I'm standing here in a church pulpit on a Sunday morning, you can probably guess what I'm going to say next. What's missing is a relationship with Jesus Christ and faith that allows a Christian to turn our problems over to the Lord and simply lean on Him. In Psalms 55, 22, the psalmist says to cast your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. In Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, Jesus himself tells us, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What does Jesus mean, do you think, when he refers to his yoke? Most of you all know what a yoke is in a literal sense. It's a wooden device that allows you to harness two or more animals together, horses, mules, oxen usually, to pull a burden like a plow or a wagon. When used by an unkind master, a yoke can be harsh and oppressive. But if sized and shaped properly, and used by a loving, caring master, the yoke makes the burden easier to move without pain or discomfort for the animals. So why did Jesus tell us to take his yoke and refer to it as light? The word yoke in the Bible is often used as a metaphor for an obligation for submission or servitude. And Jesus is saying compliance with his teachings and with God's law is actually an easy burden for us to bear despite what we might think. Whether we're smart enough to realize it or not, God, keeping God's law isn't that hard and actually makes our lives easier. Beyond that, it gives us a relationship with the Lord upon whom we can cast our problems, a solid foundation upon which we can build our lives, a source of strength that allows us to be an example to others and a strong friend to those who need it. More than that, though, and better than that, he said if we come to him with our burdens, he will give us rest. Cast your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you. That cast your cares on the Lord idea is easier said than done, though, isn't it? Modern Christians talk about turning our problems over to the Lord. Just give it up to God, we often say to others. Most of the time, we even pray and ask God to help us with it. But how often do you say amen at the end of that prayer and then say, okay, God's got this now. No need for me to worry about it anymore. And then completely move on, leaving your burden at the foot of Jesus. I, for one, have never been able to do that. I'll ask God for help, 
Then as soon as the prayer ends, I'll go right back to stressing about it and trying to figure out my own solution rather than actually giving it up to God. That's not a very good testimony for my own faith, is it? God created us in His own image and loves us, His children. He gave us His law because He loves us. He sent His Son to minister, heal, and teach, then to suffer and die on the cross in payment for our sins because He loves us. He calls us to come to Him, to enter a relationship with Him as He created us to do. We were created in His image to have a relationship with Him. In this relationship, and in our faith, we'll find strength to stand against the trials and temptations of this world. The Apostle Paul wrote Ephesians while he was imprisoned in Rome. He ended this letter to the church of Ephesus, a city on the Aegean coast in what is now Turkey, with advice from members of this new church on how to live in unity with one another and with God. If you read the last chapter of Ephesus, chapter 6, verses 10 through 17, Paul tells the congregation, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. I think verse 12 is especially applicable today. But we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. The temptations and stressors of modern life are like nothing we've encountered in the past. The world is so connected now. Meanness and evil can spread throughout the globe instantly. Things move at such a fast pace, and new worries come on us at blinding speed. We don't see things coming in time to prepare. We can't predict what will happen next. Sometimes the pressure to just give up is intense, and the problems are so powerful we don't think we can handle them. But God saw them coming long before He created this earth. He has shepherded countless generations through what seemed to them like strange new challenges. And if we can't handle them, it doesn't matter. God can handle them for us if we take the burdens with which we are laden to Jesus, who will give us peace and rest. It's rare that I get to find out what happens to a patient after I transfer care of them to the hospital staff. I can only think of two times when I actually got to learn the fate of patients who have made it to hospital in my care. Both of them happened to be people who lived in our own neighborhood. And I happened to run into people I met on the scene while walking our dog or you know, shopping or whatever. And they were able to give me an update. My young overdose patient was in no immediate danger when I said goodbye to her at the hospital. I wasn't worried about her physically, but a state of, her state of mind was a big concern for me. As I told you, I keep up a con, uh, conversation with all of my conscious, alert patients. As we approached the hospital, I took a chance based on her quiet demeanor and asked her if she prayed. She smiled and said, yes, but not lately. I know it's frowned upon, almost certainly, and maybe even forbidden in a regulation somewhere, but I asked her if she wanted me to pray with her. She said yes, and when we finished, 
She told me she was glad she wasn't successful in her attempt to take her life because if she had been, she thought God wouldn't forgive her. She told me she wanted to get some help and to be there for her children. And I made sure to let the nurse assigned to her know that she needed that help. I thought about that patient the whole time I was composing this sermon. I hope she got the help she needs and continues to seek help for her sake and for the sake of her children. I hope that she learns to cast her cares on the Lord and realizes He will sustain her. Actually, I hope to learn to do that myself, and I sincerely wish the same for all of you. We can find such inspiration, so much inspiration in the writings of Paul. He was called by Christ personally on the road to Damascus and filled with the Holy Spirit and sent out to make disciples of all men and to grow the church that has since spread around the world. He wrote many letters of guidance and encouragement to fledgling early churches, including one to a group of believers in Rome. And I'll close by reading chapter 8, verses 28 through 39 of the book of Romans. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be confirmed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in the response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against him, those whom God has chosen? If God who just, it is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered to be sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the, the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Brothers and sisters, will you pray with me now? God our Father and our Creator, Thank you for being the rock upon which we can lean, the foundation upon which we can build our lives. Thank you for being there for us to cast our burdens on you and your son, Jesus Christ. Give us the strength to be able to let go of our burdens and truly turn them over to you. Lord, this world is full of suffering people, people who think they are overwhelmed by their problems and that they have no choice but to give up. Father, open their hearts, strengthen their minds, give them the wisdom to seek you and to trust you so that they can flourish and rejoice and worship and serve you. Father, many were lifted to you in prayer this morning and we know that there are others sick and hurt around the world, around our area. Please, if it's your will, Lord, Heal them, return their health, and bring them back into your house. Watch over us as we go from your house this morning. Keep us safe during the week. Deliver us from all evil. Keep us safe from temptation. And bring us back again together to worship you in your house again next week. All these things we ask in the wonderful, precious name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. <laughs>
couldn't think of a better hymn to go with the message this morning. God bless you and have a wonderful week. And we'll see you back in two weeks here. Frosty and I will be back in two weeks. God bless. Have a great week. Thank you.